In the last few videos, we've been presenting what we call the new paradigm. And the new paradigm is based on the rediscovery or reintroduction of the ancient herb, Soma. Our research, at least, points to the psilocybin mushrooms as the main ingredient of Soma. There may also have been other ingredients, including harming containing plants similar to ayahuasca, which have, uh, since the time they were in use, gone extinct due to climate change and human impact. But the stropharia and other uh, branches of uh, psilocybin containing mushrooms are still with us. They really, they can't be wiped out. <laughs> as long as human beings cultivate cattle, the mushroom will follow us everywhere we go. Because the mushroom likes nothing better to grow in than cow pods. <laughs> Gobar in Hindi. I'm not sure what the name is in Tamil. But the point is, in the ancient traditions, the cows and the goddess have always been very closely associated. I mean the ancient traditions, 20, 30, 50, 100,000 years back. Now, in the more recent traditions, I would say from like 5,000 to 10,000 years ago to the present, the link with the goddess, the Soma, has fallen out of use or even actually been proscribed. And some of these lineages today have myths that the Soma was non-physical somehow or other. It was a, a metaphor. Huh? And these are the same people, by the way, who protest vehemently against the metaphorical understanding of the scriptures in other places. <laughs> they want to take everything literal until it comes to Soma. Then all of a sudden, that's a myth. That's a metaphor. Well, we don't think so. And when I say we, I mean a consortium of scientists, anthropologists, uh, meditators, language scholars and devotees actually going back to, my God, about the mid-60s or earlier, who have been corresponding together and researching together uh, since the 50s, 1950s at least, into this SOMA. What is SOMA? And there are a large number of scientific papers on the subject, which I'm not going to quote or refer to. That is left as an exercise, as it is said, for the viewer. So <clears throat> if you want to poke into this, you'll find out that what I'm talking about is all well substantiated in the literature. But the people who don't like this idea don't mention the literature, and when they do, it's only the Vedas, and even then, they interpret them metaphorically rather than literally. <laughs> so how can you discuss with somebody like that? It's like the identity politics in the West. You know, if you're a Democrat, you stand for a whole bunch of issues and blah, blah, blah. And if you're a Republican, you stand for a whole bunch of other issues and views. And there's no discussion. People just hurl epithets at each other. <laughs> no one is ever convinced by the debate to change sides. Everyone has an opinion, 
and thinks they're right. And they're willing to bet the farm on it, like these people who refuse vaccination. Even they get COVID and they're in the hospital, in the ICU, and they're in danger of losing their life, and they still insist that COVID is a hoax. So what to do? It is the same way with people who are against any kind of change. They're rooted in habit. They have a very solid, you know, earthy kind of personality, uh, very resistant to change. So they take shelter of habit. They say, well, it was good enough for my grandpa. It's good enough for me. These are the natural conservatives. Because the, the tension in human society is always between the habit-oriented people, the people oriented in the past, in tradition, in what grandpa did, and like that, and the open-minded people who are willing to change. And, of course, there should be, or must be, a balance. But when habit gets in the way of changes needed to uh, save humanity from climate change, extinction. You know, this is an extinction level event, people. And this has been known since the 50s, at least by the climate science community. So, and including the oil companies, by the way. They knew it. They knew that the product they were selling was going to destroy the environment, and they did it anyway. So that means our society is completely off balance. See, if a scientist uncovers in his research that the company he works for is creating an extinction level uh, danger, hazard for the whole human race, that scientist has an ethical responsibility to stop working for that company unless they change their tune, unless they form a policy to remediate. But that means change. And for a habit-oriented person, change is the most painful thing imaginable. Huh? Let's look at some of the conceptions around change. I'm going to make a word cloud here and put some of the words up on the screen as I'm reading them. Consider the opposite of habit. We say something is habit forming, right? Like chocolate cake. <laughs> well, what's the opposite of that? Habit breaking, right? But people are afraid to break their habits. Look at these people who smoke cigarettes their whole lives. And they know, because they've read or heard it, and it's well known everywhere, that cigarettes are very harmful for your health. Or meat eating, same kind of thing. There is no discussion on the subject. It's simply a flat-out rejection due to habit. See, but I mean, what, which habit are you going to follow? Which tradition are you going to follow? The tradition that's a thousand years old or 5,000 years old or 10,000 years old <laughs> or the tradition that's 50,000, 100,000, 500,000 years old. Before even agriculture, when humanity was hunter-gatherers, this is known as the Satya Yuga in the Vedic terminology. In the Satya Yuga, all needs were provided by the forest. See, and this is the ancient habit, the most ancient, huh? the, the, the original tradition of looking around and, you know, turning over cow pods to see what's underneath. And of course, if there's any mushrooms happen to be growing on it, they're very visible, very accessible. All they have to do is grab them and eat them. No preparation required. Non-toxic. No bad reactions. Huh? 
As Terence McKenna used to say, I love this quote, he said, the psychedelic drugs and plants are so powerful that they can induce psychopathic behavior in people who have never taken them. <laughs> in fact, the people who have not and will not take a, a psychedelic plant and see what it does are forever doomed to psychopathic behavior. Because if you condemn something that you have absolutely no direct personal experience in, that's nuts. You know, if somebody says, wow, this stuff is really good, huh? but then you condemn it without even trying it or without even doing serious research into it, that's crazy. That's psychopathic behavior. That's sociopathic behavior. And it's a, a very bad form of behavior in a relationship because it precludes any discussion. See, it's bad, it's wrong, and that's it. Why? Because that's my habit. My grandpa didn't do it, so I'm not going to do it. <laughs> but what if the thing that we're urging you to try is the solution to the very problems that face humanity today. Bad leadership, huh? a terrible lack of communication, especially between people on opposite sides of issues. No civil discussion, huh? even within intimate relationships, family relationships. There's no discussion possible of the real issues. The elephants in the room, huh? not just one, a whole herd of them. <laughs> Climate change is only one of them. The despicable state of social intercourse and discussion in the commons today on social media and other words, that people are just throwing words at each other without any understanding. See, this is such a bad habit. And these habits have to be overcome. But let's look at some of the words, terms, around breaking habits. Deconditioning is one. Huh? We know that meditation and other types of sadhana decondition certain habits. And this is work. It's viewed as work, and it is work. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but this is also lauded as transformation in the new age. Huh? Transformation. Well, transformation from what into what? Our old habits into some new behavior that's better and solves the problems that the old habits created. Well, what about then personal growth? Everybody loves the idea of personal growth, right? Bigger and bigger and bigger. <laughs> but we think that growth should be measured in terms of quality, not quantity. That when a person's mind and heart and their consciousness are refined into a very high state, huh, that this is personal growth, not necessarily amassing a great fortune or a lot of followers or you know, any other worldly things. And this is viewed as a creative act. Huh? I'm taking charge of my life <laughs> and I'm developing good habits now. But what about the old habits? See, the, the conception of a benefit has to be there. One has to be taking up a new habit to get rid of an old habit to replace it. So instead of driving in a gas, gasoline car, I'll uh, plant forests. See, give up one thing, take up a better thing. This is change. This is creative growth. But all creative growth has to go into an area that is unexperienced because it's new. 
That means it's part of the unknown. <laughs> and the unknown is part of our shadow. The part of us that we don't like to acknowledge, you know? Like all the bad things that you did when you were a kid. You know, just the, just the stupid things that you do when you're a kid or you're around other kids and they're daring you to do some nonsense, you know. And you do it and then you feel bad afterwards, you know. And here we are years, decades later, we still feel bad about it. So these are the things that we're afraid to acknowledge. We don't want to look at. We don't want to bring out into the light. We certainly don't want to discuss with others. But these are all part of the toolbox of transformation, of personal growth, of psychotherapy, of encounter, all these things. And these are all very challenging to our habits or to a person of habit or to someone who looks to the past to define their identity and their activities and goals and so on like this. But we want to look to the future. We want to make the future better than the past. That means we have to give up our old habits. We have to closely examine what we've been doing and transform those into good habits that lead to a world where, that we want to live in. Huh? So this is going to take change. And change is strange. It's unknown. It's unexperienced. It's new. So there's always a certain amount of trepidation and fear and, and delay. Huh? People will put off going to therapy, but they won't put off going out to drink with their buddies. Isn't it? People will put off going to the doctor and getting a checkup and go out and eat meat at an expensive restaurant instead. Why is this? They don't want to change their habits. They're afraid, actually, to change their habits because the new, the unknown, is alien, isn't it? It's unpredictable. Huh? If aliens were to show up here, you know, I mean, it's, you know, real aliens, not Hollywood aliens. Hollywood aliens are about as different from you and me as our old eccentric Uncle Fred. You know, they're not really that different from humanity. Just, you know, they have more arms or more eyes or something, you know, or, a, you know, a really bad skin condition <laughs> or something like that. But they're not really alien. You know, if we encounter something really alien, that's a mind-blowing experience. But that's what the future is. The future... I, as William Burroughs, think, I think, said, the future's business is being dangerous. Why? Because it's unknown. It's unpredictable. It's in that whole area of newness, of novelty, that we are loath to enter. Huh? We, we need a little novelty. We like, we're not afraid of, you know, watching a new show on TV. Right? If we don't like it, we can always turn it off, or whatever. But what we don't like is when reality enforces novelty, like cl climate change, like social breakdown, you know, like a pandemic. All these things are forced on us, and they're new, they're unpredictable. Nobody could see it coming, except a few experts, perhaps. But what we need to do to really change, to really transform, is to lose this attachment to habit, to develop a taste for novelty and newness 
and creativity and transformation and all these things that are going to bring us to our final perfection. This we can't see. And the reason we can't see? Attachment to habits. So you can see all these things for yourself. Huh? These are the incomprehensible, the non-understandable, like Krishnamurti used to call it, beyond the mind, uh, beyond the known, beyond the knowable. So they're going to be very surprising. Black swans, huh? They come out of nowhere, or they come out of somewhere that we think we understand fully, but actually we don't. And it gives us a big surprise. And that's what the goddess has for all of us. <laughs> goddess has got a boatload of huge surprises in store for us. So <laughs> shouldn't we drop a few of our old habits and our old ways and go to her and find out what they are? Aum Tatsat. <laughs> Aum Shakti Aum.